Hello, my friends. I figured it was about time we actually give an old look-see at a misunderstood, forgotten, sometimes unknown game in the series. That's right, I'm talking about the Mafa Conspiracy, the sequel to Golgo 13, released for the- yeah, this is about the Pokemon trading card game too. But also like, if you follow my channel at all, you know I've done a handful of challenges for this game, so it shouldn't be unknown to you fine folk, at least through my perspective. I didn't make the game. So now you're probably thinking that I've already covered this game three times, and I went over every vending card in the game, and I did that in four videos. But you know what? Maybe you don't care about specific Japanese-only cards in the game or watching me blather on about how I can beat the entire thing with a lowly sand slash. Maybe you just want to hear me blather on about the straight history and facts about it. And that's why I wanted to make this video. This is going to be sort of like the Perspective, but not really. I'm only covering North American releases in that series, and well, this game was Japan only, baby. So let's examine this, what has sort of become a cult classic. Also, like, I already have a ton of footage to use for it, so I can take it easy with that part. Heck yeah. So on December 18th, 1998, the Pokemon trading card game was released for the Game Boy Color in Japan. In that, you are Mark, and you aim to defeat all of the Club Masters, and then the four Grand Masters, and finally the Champion to obtain the sought-after Legendary cards, consisting of Articuno, Zapdos, Moltres, and Dragonite. It was a fairly big hit, as it was during the Pokemon card craze, and yeah, I've covered this game numerous times in challenges, and its own standalone episode too. No reason to go further into anything about the story there. So the developers got to work on a sequel to it, and apparently there were plans to release an English version at one point, it just never happened. This was actually the first game in the Pokemon series to be published by the Pokemon Company as well, and had the returning developer of the first game, Hudson Soft. The intent was to take the cards that were present in the original game and then add on some recently released sets to keep it more up to date. The original game just had base set, jungle, and fossil, as well as some promo cards and a few exclusives made for in-game only. These cards were exact replicas of the ones you can buy from packs and decks in real life, so if you didn't have any friends to play with, this was perfect. But what's interesting is the time frame in which this game was released. So okay, try and follow me on this because this is quite the timeline. The original trading card game Physical Cards were the first items to be released with the base set in October of 1996 in Japan, Jungle came out in March of 97, Fossil in June of 97, Team Rocket in November of 97, and finally Gym Heroes in October of 98. Then the Game Boy Color game came out in Japan just two months later in December of 98, which finally brings us to the English release of Base Set in January of 1999, Jungle came out in June of 99, the same time as Gym Challenge in Japan, the English Fossil set was in October of 99, and yeah, you can kind of see that everything was really playing catch up with the English releases. And we're not done yet! Gen 2 kicked off in Japan with Gold and Silver in November of 99, a few months before North America even got the original Game Boy Color TCG. Gen 2 card sets in Japan started to come out with Neo Genesis in February of 2000, which finally brings us to the English release of the TCG in April of 2000. Whew. Basically, these cards were everywhere at the time with frequent releases, still going on to this day too. But the point of me bringing all this up is when the sequel to TCG came out. The second Gen 2 set, Neo Discovery, was released in Japan in July of 2000, then Neo Revelation in December of 2000. They were now 9 card sets in, so just how many sets were they able to include when the sequel came out in March of 2001? Yeah, the first 4. Plus some other side sets. Yeah, I feel like with the rapid rate of these cards coming out, they pretty much had to draw the line somewhere. There is still, like, game development time and all. So this next game, which goes by many names depending on the translation, such as Pokemon Trading Card Game 2, The Invasion of Team GR, Pokemon Card GB2, Team Great Rocket is here, Pokemon Card GB2, Great Rocket Dan Sanjo, and Pokemon Card GB2, Here Comes Great Team Rocket. But for simplicity's sake, I'll just call it TCG2. So yeah, TCG2 included cards from Base Set, Jungle, Fossil, and Team Rocket, many promo cards, the majority of cards from the Japan-only vending machine sets, see my four videos for everything on that, and then some cards from Japan-only intro sets, and some dark versions created just for the game. In total, 381 cards compared to 187 from the first game, so there was still quite a bit of variety. 
All of the Pokémon featured were still restricted to Gen 1, except for three special Gen 2 promo cards of Togepi, Meryl, and Lugia. Per Paraspective tradition, I typically go over the box art and blurbs, but there isn't a whole lot to say about it, and this isn't a traditional Paraspective video. But I'll still mention it because I kinda like it. It's simply the energy symbols and cards flying at you with electricity everywhere from a charged up Voltorb in the middle. And this Voltorb is angry, going solid white-eyed like it's the God of Thunder. Why Voltorb? I don't know, but it works. The original game cover just had a Pokeball in the middle, but this cover wants you to know that it isn't messing around. This Pokeball is alive, and it's going to hit you with extreme voltage and colorful Pokemon cards. The plot of this game actually does act as a legit sequel, too. You once again take control of Mark, but you can also pick the new female counterpart, Mint. While adding a female character is a pretty obvious and welcome addition that took them until the release of the Crystal version to add this option into the franchise, Mint was never in the original game, so it just makes more sense canonically to play as Mark. Sorry, I didn't make up the story. It picks up right after you obtain the legendary cards from the champion, Ronald, and... Oh no! Great Rocket is using their dastardly blimp to steal all of the cards from you and kidnap the Clubmasters. Considering all anybody cares about in this world are battling cards, this is basically like sapping the life force out of civilization here. This island exists solely for card matches, so once you take that away, there's nothing left. I guess it's up to you to figure out what is going on here, get your cards back, and free the captured club and grandmasters. So yeah, they really went in some pretty crazy directions with the story here, especially compared to the first game. The story of that game is just to be the best and get the legendary cards. That's really about it. You meet and defeat each clubmaster and your rival along the way who is also competing to be the best. It's even more bare bones than the original red and blue versions, but still follows the same sort of structure. Red and blue has you beat 8 gyms, then the elite 4, and then your rival to be the champion. TCG1 has you beat 8 clubmasters, 4 grandmasters, and then your rival to become the champion. But now all of a sudden, folks are being straight up kidnapped, sometimes being put into life-threatening situations. I was certainly not expecting this my first time playing it. And of course, in Red and Blue, you occasionally encounter the evil organization Team Rocket, led by the mastermind Giovanni, who seeks to steal Pokémon, sell them, do experiments on them, really just some awful animal cruelty stuff. You get in their way to stop their evil doings by just making their Pokemon faint in standardized rule-following battles. They even pay you money for winning like normal trainers do. Yeah, that never really made a lot of sense to me. Team Rocket sets out to experiment on Pokemon and force them into battling against their will. Oh no! Well, my solution is to have my Charizard use Flamethrower on this poor Slowpoke with intense hot flames that can melt almost anything and cause terrible pain. That'll put an end to the torture they're inflicting on these Pokemon. I guess all the ones they own are lost causes at this point, right? So TCG2 pretty much incorporates this idea with Great Rocket, led by the mastermind known as Biruchi, Biruchi, the King, translated to King Valici in one of the English translated versions. So they can't really experiment and do research on Pokemon cards. These are cards, not real Pokemon. So what is their ultimate goal? To be honest, I still don't really know. At least in the translated version, the king says, Pokemon cards are to be used solely to fight and win, and that he founded Great Rocket on this philosophy. I've pretty much concluded that this plot is really not meant to be taken seriously at all. They just want to steal cards so they can win card battles easier. They're pretty much just school bullies on the playground, except they have their own island complete with a castle, a blimp, and the capabilities of literally kidnapping people. It's pretty bonkers. The king also absolutely puts down those who just want to collect the cards and not actually play the game. I feel like back in the day, a pretty large percentage of those who collected the cards didn't even know how to play the game, so I guess this guy is supposed to make those people angry. How dare he dictate the reason behind me collecting cards? I'll show him by playing the card game. Like I said, you aren't playing this game for the plot. And speaking of the plot, once Great Rocket steals all of the Clubmaster's cards, your cards, and kidnaps them, you meet up with Ronald, who tells you to speak to Dr. Mason. Dr. Mason tasks you with retrieving the stolen cards, gives you a starter deck, and then you're off to explore the clubs. Nobody else is doing anything about it except for Ronald, so it's up to you to do all of the work for them. 
Sprinkled about the island are four hooded great rocket members known as GR numbers 1 through 4. These evildoers are bullying Isaac of the Lightning Club, putting Murray of the Psychic Club under mind control, trapping all of the Water Club members in a cage in the water, trapping the Fire Club members in a cage surrounded by fire. They've kidnapped Science Leader Rick, Fighting Leader Mitch, and each of the Grandmasters, and the Grass Club ladies went into hiding. Things are in complete chaos. The only one who stands up to them and wins is Rock Leader Gene. Really? That guy? Alright. But defeating each GR member gives you one-fourth of a GR coin. Once you get all four pieces, you are able to go to the airport to go to GR Island, where you can finally put a stop to their plans. Things pretty much follow a similar structure here where you rescue Rick, Mitch, and the Grandmasters, but the gameplay sort of shifts a little here. The card battles on the regular island go the same as they do in the original game. Each time you defeat someone, you get packs of cards to be able to add more and more cards to your collection to make decks to play with. Very straightforward. But the GR Island adds a twist. Most of these card battles have certain requirements you must meet in order to fight them. These could be a variety of things like each of our decks must contain four Pikachu cards. The Grass Fortress leader says that no Grass Pokemon can have a status condition. One has me only use lightning energies, etc. It depends on the person you're fighting or where you are. There's at least one trainer in each fortress who demands you only use one type of energy, so this little addition helps to keep things fresh. I like this idea, but it can really put a damper on challenge ideas for me. For instance, in my Parasect only challenge, being forced to only use water energies negated my ability to use any moves that use grass energies. So I was restricted to only being able to use Slash. It added a little to the challenge, but I have to be careful with ideas in the future, as some could be impossible to complete with these restrictions. Anyway, these are a nice little twist. My personal favorite is the Psychic Stronghold, where you're introduced to four different trainers, each with their own deck restrictions, and you must choose three of them to defeat. So once you make your way to the castle, the momentum comes to a bit of a halt here, in my opinion. You have to defeat the two executives before you can take on the king himself, which is simple enough. Except one of them demands that your deck contains the four legendary cards that you acquired at the end of the first game. How do you get these? Why, you have to travel by blimp all the way back to the main island to defeat all four Grandmasters in order to get the legendary cards back. The Grandmasters that you just saved from being kidnapped. I think this is pretty ridiculous, personally. You already proved yourself in the last game by beating each of them and inquiring the cards. Then they were stolen right from you at the beginning of this game, and then you saved each of the Grandmasters on the GR Island. Why should I have to go back and prove myself again? I mean, I guess in the end it's just more card games, which is the entire point of you playing this game to begin with, but it just comes across as time-wasting busy work when you're so close to the end of the game. And you're doing all of this just to fight that one executive. You don't even have to use the legendary cards once you defeat him. So once you defeat him, you can take on the king in a best of three tournament. I do like this idea, as he uses different decks each time. Once you defeat him, he realizes that cards can be for collecting too, and it's not all about winning. He actually had fun fighting you, so he vows to go down a different path, as he then gives you a Togepi coin as a symbol of friendship and a promo Mewtwo card. Yeah, this story is pretty stupid, but I feel like they kinda knew this. They wanted it to be pretty out there and just have fun with it. I mean, what can they really do with an island of people who exist only to play the Pokemon trading card game? I mean, there's even one point where you rescue Mitch from being kidnapped, the kidnapper, Tony, then gives Mitch some booster packs, and Mitch asks him if it's okay. Like, what is going on here? That's funny stuff. So yes, the story is nonsensical, but as I said, you're here to play the card game, and that is where the game excels. If you like the Pokemon trading card game, this is just that on the Game Boy Color, but with more cards and battles than in the first game. And yeah, these are a lot of fun. The deck requirement matches can be hit or miss, but the point is for the added challenge, and it's a lot of fun finding out what these are going to be each time. The annoying part is if they demand four specific cards and you don't actually have four of them, You'll have to go out and find trainers that give these packs and hope that you actually get these cards in them. That could end up being very time consuming. This did happen to me a couple times with having to go seek out four mysterious fossils to slap in the deck. But again, it does add to the late game challenge. I think the game looks better than the first one too. And as I said, there are a lot more cards here, more than double. Having no knowledge of all of the Japanese-only cards before ever playing this game, these were all brand new to discover for me, and I love a lot of the vending machine cards. 
Back when my friends and I used to actually collect them, we were super into it during the releases of the Jungle and Fossil expansions, and then continued to buy the Team Rocket packs, but it was around this point when we started to shift away from collecting them. It was a lot of fun rediscovering the Rocket set alongside all of these new cards I'd never seen before. I mentioned before that at one point there was a plan to adapt TCG2 to an English release, but it never happened. In doing some research, the main reasons I can see as to why this never happened were for two reasons. One, there were so many Japan-only cards in this game that it probably would have confused North American consumers. What are these vending cards? Where can we buy these, etc.? And secondly, it was the time that this game came out. March 28, 2001 for the Game Boy Color. The successor to the Game Boy Color, the Game Boy Advance, had literally come out in Japan one week earlier, and it was due to be released in North America in June. The focus was on trying to promote this new system, so maybe spending time and resources on localizing a sequel to a Gen 1 based Game Boy Color game with a lot of Japanese only cards probably wasn't worth it in the long run. The Gen 2 games of Gold and Silver were already out in North America even, so it probably was best to let this one go. Which is a shame, because it's a fun experience. However, my best guess is that this wouldn't have come out until 2002, or even late 2001 at the earliest. I did stop being into Pokemon a little before Ruby and Sapphire came out, and I no longer collected the cards, so maybe me, among many others, wouldn't have had much interest in it by that point. Pokemania did eventually die down a bit, and right about at this point too, so I guess from a business standpoint, they probably made the right call. The original game ended up selling 3.7 million copies, so it's safe to say that the sequel would have been significantly less, even with the English release. Thus, we are left with this strange Japan-only game acting as the TCG finale. Luckily, there are of course fan translations available, so it's certainly not lost in time by any means. It is definitely a unique experience, and I'm glad I was finally able to play it. The trading card game itself, though, is still going strong with consistent set releases to this day. There was also TCG Online that started in 2011 that featured up-to-date sets for use, as it was easy to apply them onto an online game rather than the restrictions of a cartridge. TCG Live is the successor to that game released in 2023, so it's not like the TCG video games died off completely. But yeah, there's just something about these Game Boy Color games that really feed into the nostalgia of the time. If you're a fan of the vintage cards, I think these are both well worth your time. And this is where I would normally throw in the Where's That Parasect segment, but this isn't a normal Perspective episode. You know where Parasect is. Go rewatch my two-part challenge again. It's fun. You'll love it. Here, I'll even throw the link down below. And there we go. And hey, thanks again. So that was fun. I'm glad I got to make a separate episode on this, as it has been pretty important to the channel. I'm not sure exactly when the actual Perspective will return, but stay tuned. There will certainly be more content about something in the meantime. Do check out the old Patreon if you want to learn more about my virtual cards and stickers and stuff, as all of the support is super appreciated from me. Thanks again, and until next time, Paraspector will return.